James Coleman was born in Bedford, Indiana in 1926, where he lived through the Great Depression in his childhood years. His family moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where his father took a job as a factory foreman. Coleman attended a technical high school where he played football and then joined the Navy right after graduation in the middle of World War II. After the war, he earned a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Purdue and was recruited to work at Eastman Kodak. Instead, he made a radical shift to graduate study of sociology at Columbia University, completing his PhD in 1951. After graduation, he continued postdoctoral research at Columbia's Bureau of Applied Social Research for two years and then was invited to spend another research year at the prestigious Center for Advanced Study of Behavioral Science up on a hillside in Palo Alto above Stanford University, where he wrote this article. Coleman went on to a successful career at the University of Chicago and Johns Hopkins, becoming one of the country's foremost scholars and experts on schools and the sociology of education. This article, one of his earliest publications, is on quite a different subject, however. It reflects the strong formative influence on his theoretical perspective exercised by Robert Merton during graduate study at Columbia. If he hadn't centered his career on education research, it is interesting to speculate on what more Coleman might have written about religion. Although Coleman aimed at the question of religious conflict in this article, he was not interested primarily in the phenomenon of religion or religious social organization. He had his sights set higher at this early stage of his career on the whole panorama of society and all its complexity. That's why he starts the article with a discussion of general principles of why conflict exists in human society. This is where his use of the term cleavage comes in. The word has nothing to do with fashions and clothing. It refers to a drastic cut or break in some object, such as you might make with a stroke of a cleaver. The San Andreas Fault is a cleavage in the Earth's crust. Coleman wants to draw our attention to what he sees as a fundamental general feature of human social relations. People seem to look for similarities between themselves and other people, and then are attracted to these other people that they perceive as like themselves. This attraction yields what social scientists call in-groups. In high school, you called them cliques. The trouble is, says Coleman, we never seem to be able to finish the job and see similarities between ourselves and everyone else. We make a start at it, identify some in-group for ourselves, and then we get tired of the effort and call it a day. This leaves everybody else in the world as an out-group. Your family can be an in-group, or not, depending on how you get along with them. So can your fraternity, your sorority, your racial or ethnic group, your religion, your country, and so on. But we always leave the job half done. There's always an out group. Wherever we draw these boundaries, and we draw lots of them, that's where conflict shows up in society. It's us against them, Republicans against Democrats, women against men. Christians against Muslims, whatever seems important. While Coleman recognizes that religion is just one institutional dimension of societies, he includes religion in the title of his article because, as he puts it, quote, religious attachments have been among the most powerful that men can feel, unquote. This was written back in the day when saying men like this meant the same as saying human. He's not necessarily saying that men feel religious more than women, which we know isn't true anyway. In all such cases, we're always talking about conflicts that crop up because we have defined some kind of in-groups and out-groups, at least some of which are religious groups. He does mention boundaries and conflicts between religion and other social institutions at what Chavez called his third or societal level, such as we've seen with the conflict between the Catholic Church and the Italian fascists' political religion. But Coleman doesn't bring that third or societal level of religious authority into his theory or his examples much. Instead, he starts right away on the first page of the article to clarify the distinction between two kinds of religious conflicts that put us in the middle of Stark's religious marketplace, 
or Chavez's second or organizational level of religious authority. On one hand, we can find conflicts between different religions. So far, all the religions developed by human beings provide classic illustrations of our inability to find similarities that extend universally. So every religion ends up confined to a subset of the human race. This comes partly, Coleman explains, because the course of our daily lives only puts us in direct contact with a tiny fraction of humanity, our family, neighbors, co-workers, and so on. Even if we invent some mass media for ourselves, we still find ourselves restricted by language barriers and other boundaries or cleavages. So every religion, which generates some of the most powerful attachments that we can feel, is itself an in-group with a boundary. This automatically means there will be conflicts with the rest of the world in the out-group on the other side of that boundary. Coleman also mentions what he calls conflicts within religions, which we probably should admit really amount to a special case of his conflicts between religions, because what is happening in these cases is that people are forming in-groups and out-groups within the religion itself, or in other words, creating multiple religions where there was only one before. A great example of this would be the Great Schism in AD 1056 between the Eastern Orthodox and Western Catholic halves of the Christian religion. They even called it a schism, which is just a cleavage spelled differently. Such are the imperfections of humans and their inability to recognize connections between themselves and others that we seem to be creating these cleavages and boundaries all the time. It may be our favorite hobby as a species. What interests Coleman more is why religion in particular seems to be such a productive, perennial source of cleavages, boundaries, and conflict throughout human history. He goes into some detail on what he sees as unique about religion, but also mentions other motives that you could find in pretty much any social institution. The first unique source is what he calls the individual private nature of religious experience for individuals. Behavioral psychologists have called this the world of private data, things about people that we can never actually know only make guesses by gathering information about what people tell us and how they behave, things we can actually observe. What is the reality of seeing the color blue? It's the same wavelength of light for everybody, but do we all see it the same way? Or is blue for me something quite different from blue for you, a difference that can never actually be documented or communicated? Religious experience is thus like the elephant encountered by the five blind guys. They each guessed differently what it was like based on their different, incomplete experiences. This is one reason, says Coleman, why people keep creating new cleavages between religions and also between religion and the rest of society. Religion is something special, as John Lennon might have said, because it's so hard to see. The other reason that Coleman mentions to explain all the cleavages and boundaries that come out of religion is more ordinary and could also apply to other kinds of social institutions. Religious cults split off from larger organized religions, he says, in part because ambitious individuals see this as a way to gain power and prestige for themselves. Why just sit in a pew with everybody else when you can become a guru and have people hanging on your every word? maybe even treating you like a divine and supernatural being. This is why junior military officers also sometimes try to organize a coup to take over an army or a government. It's why people quit their jobs to go into business for themselves. It's one reason for some people to start all kinds of social movements. But with religion, since the ultimate nature of religious experience is so mysterious, literally anybody can set themselves up as a new religion. Startup costs are basically zero. The Internal Revenue Service in the United States, which has to evaluate a massive number of claims for religious exemptions from taxes, has decided that all you have to do to prove that you are a religion of your own is be able to document that you have a certain number of followers. That number is pretty low, too. It's a very popular sport and a never-ending source of new cleavages and boundaries on the social landscape. Coleman wasn't telling us anything new by pointing out how and why religion seems to be such a never-ending 
wellspring for cleavages, boundaries, and conflicts in human society. The business about in-groups and out-groups also was just standard sociology that he had picked up in his classes at Columbia. We turn now to how he got creative with this raw material and spun it out into some new sociological patterns. The first ingredient to add to the previous ones involves recognizing that not only is society differentiated into separate institutions, one of which is religion, in a way that creates boundaries or cleavages between these institutions. Cleavages also appear within every social institution. We already know about cleavages within religion, different competing faiths, and so on. The political institution can be divided into competing parties in the same way. On top of these cleavages within institutions, other boundaries in society exist even without formal institutionalized internal organization. We can describe and discuss social classes and ethnic groups in society but an ethnic group does not have a pope in charge of it. These social distinctions also create cleavages and boundaries. Coleman wants us to think about how such boundaries compare to the boundaries between religions and other institutions in society. In particular, he suggests that we consider what might happen if all the boundaries marking lots of different dimensions of social cleavage all lined up in a society so that they all reinforced each other. The example that he provides concerns the historical position of Jewish communities over many centuries throughout Europe. In these Jewish communities, says Coleman, quote, there have seldom been cross-cutting lines of cleavage which tied them to other persons in society. Partly out of choice, partly out of necessity created by persecution, they have constituted not only a religious group, but a cultural group, an ethnic group, a particular economic stratum of society, and a group closely knit by associational bonds." Unquote. This last part about association means they live together in segregated neighborhoods. In a situation like this, Coleman suggests, if a conflict emerges across any one of these multiple boundaries, it's easy for it to be translated to all the other kinds of boundaries because the same people line up in all the different in-groups and out-groups. When all the boundaries of all the different social dimensions overlap, he says, group conflicts are at their strongest. Before you know it, things escalate. He calls this runaway or explosive conflict, since there's nothing to stop it or even slow it down. On the contrary, the fact that every kind of difference between people coincides at the same boundary actually reinforces the conflicts. People end up getting run out of town or burned up inside their houses or various other unpleasant possibilities. In contrast, if you unhook these different cleavages or boundaries from one another so they don't coincide, Coleman concludes that the result will be very different. We already have a name for one aspect of this unhooking. Institutional differentiation unbundles religious, political, economic, military, educational, and other boundaries in society so that knowing a person's religion no longer automatically tells us their political party or their social class position. The boundaries existing within each institution are not lined up with other boundaries in other institutions, at least not necessarily. The same can be true for other dimensions of social identity not crystallized into institutional form, such as social class or ethnicity. This differentiation of society a source of worry to some scholars, amounts to a desirable strength from Coleman's point of view. When any of these lines start to overlap again, as for example, if African-American ethnicity also implies a predictable social class position, a predictable residential location, and other predictable matching cleavages or boundaries in society, explosive conflicts become more likely and our ability to resolve problems and conflicts is reduced by this overlap. Instead of a tendency to run away or explosive conflict, Coleman believes that when the boundaries in different social dimensions get scrambled and cut across one another, they create what he calls cross pressures. Two workers on an assembly line in a car factory in Detroit may be separated by an ethnic cleavage if one is Polish-American and the other is Mexican-American. 
but they stand together on the same side of the boundary between factory management and the auto workers union. And they're both on the same side of the boundary that defines the Roman Catholic Church as an in-group. What happens when people caught in such cross pressures find themselves coming into some kind of conflict, such as hostility between Polish and Mexican communities? Coleman predicts that such cross pressured people try to avoid talking about such conflict. They don't bring it up with each other. They don't drag their friends into such arguments. They try to find some reasonable compromise or other solution rather than adding in every other possible kind of difference with the other person to reinforce emotional hostility. Cross pressures reduce conflicts across a particular social boundary or cleavage when that boundary no longer lines up with all the other boundaries from other social dimensions. Coleman looks at this beneficial role of cross pressures from both ends of the telescope. On one hand, you can reduce conflicts between different religious groups if the other boundaries in society do not match boundaries between different religions. If you have poor people and rich people in the same church, or black and white and Asian and Native American people, or Republicans and Democrats sitting together in the pews, the sermon that Sunday probably would avoid taking sides in issues like the next election or a strike that has been called against a local factory. But if all the factory owners go to the Episcopal Church on the town square, while all the factory workers go to a Pentecostal church on the edge of town, as Goldschmidt observed in California, the sermons in these churches would be more likely to take sides in a strike at a factory, hardening the cleavages of both religion and social class and making the strike harder to settle. This moderating effect of cross pressures may be one reason why many people think it might be a good idea to have more diversity in congregations, whether that means diverse ethnicities, political preferences, or economic backgrounds. Yet when we look inside actual congregations, we find a definite tendency for people to sort themselves out, as Goldschmidt observed, so that the cleavages from different dimensions of society begin to drift together and line up. We'll come back to this problem later. From the other side of Coleman's perspective of cross pressures, you also can increase the flexibility of other institutions to do their jobs in society if religious diversity appears within them. A classic example of cleavages that overlapped and caused problems could be the concentration of Irish immigrants in the police forces of some northeastern U.S. cities, like Boston, around the start of the 20th century. The Irish cop became a stereotype appearing in movies and the popular imagination. But this caused problems for law enforcement in Italian, African-American, or Jewish neighborhoods. If your police force hires a new officer who happens to be a Sikh woman who wears a turban with a badge on it, the cross pressures of religious and ethnic solidarity can help people see past the cleavage between police and civilians. This idea of cross pressures as a desirable goal in society not only suggests that we should think about the trend towards institutional differentiation in society as a good thing, but that in fact it seems like a good idea in general to aim for such a result across all dimensions of social life. This may explain why the Vulcans, those wise pointy-eared aliens in Star Trek, had IDIC, which stands for Infinite Diversity in Infinite Combinations, as the basis of their civilization and philosophy. The insights so far from Coleman's article center on the idea that cross pressures tend to reduce conflict caused by cleavages in society. I'll never forget a similar idea demonstrated by my high school physics teacher. He set up two speakers, each broadcasting the same oscillating sound, and then showed us that if you stand at a certain specific point where the sound waves exactly canceled each other, you couldn't hear anything. I was astonished. You've seen the same effect when ripples on a pond intersect with each other, canceling each other out. In physics, this is called destructive interference, and it is very much like what Coleman sees as the effect of cross pressures on conflicts in society. From his perspective, we ought to encourage institutional differentiation and infinite diversity and infinite combinations in all dimensions of social organization, so that anytime conflicts arise, 
numerous cross pressures from other aspects of social life will enter into the picture and minimize such conflicts within a larger perspective. And yet we still seem to be plagued with social conflicts, and we seem highly resistant to the advice of the Vulcans. We insist on lining up all kinds of social cleavages so they reinforce each other and literally make waves in society. What's our problem? Coleman himself doesn't say that conflicts go away, that they just evaporate like fog in the morning sun. He actually says, quote, cleavage may come between individuals or within individuals, unquote. This reminds me of an item in a San Diego newspaper many years ago. A family living in a little house not far from the San Diego Wild Animal Park had an old beat-up couch in the living room that had sagging springs and lumps and bumps in the cushions. These were peculiar lumps and bumps, though. If you sat on a bump and bounced up and down a little, it would go down. But the bump would then reappear in another cushion at the other end of the couch. They didn't think anything of this until one day an 18-foot anaconda slowly slithered out of the couch onto the living room floor. It had crawled away from the wild animal park, eaten a few neighborhood pets, and then crawled into the house and gone to sleep in the couch. That anaconda is like conflict in human society. It's just the way we are as human beings. We get into conflicts with each other. If you suppress the conflict in one level of society, such as by having lots of cross pressures between institutions and other social dimensions, that conflict isn't automatically gone. Coleman suggests, in fact, that it is displaced from the level of interpersonal interactions to the intrapersonal world of each individual's internal self-perceptions and identity. The two auto plant workers feel the conflict within themselves. Am I mad at this other guy because his ethnic group is in conflict with my group? Or am I his loyal comrade because we're both brothers in the auto workers union? And in fact, both things are true and both emotions have to coexist at the same time inside the same person. This boils down to the fact that when all the fault lines or cleavages in society line up and coincide with each other, you end up with a very consistent personal identity, reinforced and unified by all the different social dimensions of your life. But when the boundaries diverge and intersect each other, like those ripples on the pond, those different social dimensions of your life make competing claims on your sense of who you are, how you feel, and what you should do about it. To explore the ramifications of what such internal inconsistencies in identity might mean for your mental health, you would need to go over to the psychology department and take a few courses there. But this internal issue of competing identities coming from different dimensions of your life makes it very clear why we human beings do not just immediately agree about how valuable these cross currents would be and rush right out and make sure our social boundaries are all scrambled across each other. We don't do this because it makes us uncomfortable. This is how the old saying that birds of a feather flock together got to be an old saying in the first place. Our little eyes peer out at a vast, intimidating world, and when we see other people who look like us or talk like us, or dress like us, or perhaps worship like us, we don't feel so all alone. Our awareness that there can be strength in numbers is like a psychological force of gravity that attracts us to these other people, and that also creates a natural tendency to reinforce that attraction, that strength, from every available angle. We're drawn towards lined up, overlapping boundaries in our social environment, the same way that moths are drawn to a flame. The consequences of this apparent human tendency to actually try to create conformity between these boundaries from different social dimensions is very simple and predictable. By doing so, we encourage waves of conflict in and between societies. The destructive interface of cross pressures that might shift these conflicts from between persons to within persons may be good for social harmony but because these cross pressures are uncomfortable, we avoid them as much as possible and have religious schisms, class exploitation, racial prejudice, and other kinds of dangerous waves in society instead. Nobody said humans were perfect after all. 